welcome to the ICAEW Insights in Focus podcast. Hello and welcome to a podcast from the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales on the audits of less complex entities. I'm Sophie Campkin, Technical Lead in ICAW's Audit and Assurance Faculty. There's been a lot of talk about less complex entity audits recently, and that's because the International Auditing Standards Centre, the IAASB, recently issued an exposure draft for a standard for less complex entity audits. This is major progress. The exposure draft issued is far from perfect, but the fact that it has been issued is a cause for celebration. ICAW's been a strong supporter of less complex standards for the audits of less complex entities for many years. The issue of an exposure draft is the start of a journey. There are significant technical issues to address before we even think about potential for adoption. And it's important to remember for now that the exposure draft has been issued by the International Standards Setter, the IAASB, and not by the Financial Reporting Council in the UK. The response deadline is 31st of January next year. ICAW has formed a working group to help develop its response, and we're gathering views from an exceptionally wide range of stakeholders as part of that process, including the public sector, the third sector, business representatives, and credit rating and funding agencies, among others. The number of registered auditors is in gradual decline, not least because audit exemption limits have risen over the years. There are many smaller entities that have voluntary audits for a number of reasons, but it would not appear to be in the public interest that auditors could only train in larger firms, or that audit services should become unavailable to smaller entities. Having an auditing standard for less complex entities might be one way to ensure that this doesn't happen. So what do we have in the exposure draft, and what are the major challenges? The exposure draft is some 100 pages long, as against over a 1,000 pages of the main or extended auditing standards. The IAASB has retained the majority of the requirements, but has replaced application material with essential explanatory material. So one question is whether there'd be enough clear blue water between an audit conducted under the main or extended auditing standards and an audit conducted under the proposed standard. Another question is about whether there should be any clear blue water between the two, and whether the sole purpose of the proposed standard is to explain how an audit is to be done more clearly. Other significant questions surround the proposed exclusion of group audits, the scope of the standard and which entities it should be applied to and whether the IAASB could be more radical in its proposals, especially when it comes to work on internal controls. My panel today is well versed in all of these issues. My first panellist is Fiona Wilkinson. Fiona was president of ICAW from 2019 to 2020 and is a board member of the International Federation of Accountants, IFAC, and chair of its Public Policy and Regulatory Advisory Group. She's been a member of the ICAW's Council since 2003 and has also served as chair of the Professional Standards Board, an ICAW Board Director and chair of the Ethics Advisory Committee. She qualified as an ICAW Chartered Accountant in 1980 with Deloitte and spent 11 years in the firm's audit department before setting up her own practice as a technical consultant providing engagement quality control reviews and audit compliance reviews for small and medium-sized firms. I'm also joined by Catherine Harding, Catherine's partner with Price Bailey. She joined the firm in 2003, having qualified with EY. She's the firm's compliance partner, chair of ICAW's Less Complex Entity Audits Working Group, a member of ICAW's main auditing committee and an ICAW board member for education and training. My final panellist is Catherine Bagshaw. Catherine is a long-standing staff member with ICAW's Audit and Assurance Faculty. She qualified in 1990 with EY and is a former member and deputy chair of IFAC's S&P committee. She's secretary to ICAW's Less Complex Entity Audits Working Group. Having two Catherines is a recipe for confusion, so I'm going to refer to Catherine Harding as Catherine H and Catherine Bagshaw as Catherine B. Fiona, you're a past president of ICAW and you've audited or reviewed the audits of many less complex entities over the years. Do you think this exposure draft is something ICAW and the other UK professional bodies should be supporting from a strategic point of view? What do you think some of the benefits might be? Yes, I do think we should be supporting this. I have been in the profession long enough to remember the days of auditing guidelines and then we had the statements of auditing standards. And it's hard to believe now that those standards used to be so short. And yet, I don't think that the quality of audits was any worse then than it is now. Auditing standards should not be rocket science, but attempts by the IAASB to achieve some degree of proportionality and scalability including its ISA Clarity project in 2010, clearly haven't solved the problem of ever longer standards 
that appear to be designed for larger audits rather than for small and non-complex entities. The real risk we are facing globally is that if the standard for LCEs is not adopted by jurisdictions around the world, the remarkable consensus built up by the IAASB over 40 years on auditing standards is going to be lost. Fragmentation and different standards all over the world. Public interest demands that audit be available for small entities and that we have a good supply of auditors trained in a wide variety of environments. I most definitely think that ICAW and the other professional bodies should be supporting this project. The main benefit should be that auditors then focus on really thinking about where the risks lie and then properly targeting their audit work on those areas of risk rather than filling in boxes on audit programmes which are simply there to ensure that all the complex requirements of the ICES UK are met. And Catherine H, you're chair of ICAW's working group on less complex entity audits. Are we going to see some pushback to IWSB on some of these proposals? What do you think are the main areas IWSB needs to fix before we get a standard that's fit for purpose? First of all, I think it's clear that at least some groups should be in scope. It's a nonsense to say that all groups are inherently complex. They're not. For example, you can have a simple charity with a trading subsidiary, or for family companies, they may just have a holding company which may just own shares in the trading company and own a property used by the business. These are both going to be audited by the same audit team and are not complex. It is also clear that we need to have a good look at the internal controls issue. There are still many who believe that design and implementation work in internal controls is excessive when a substantive audit approach is taken. There are some genuine differences of opinion here. Personally, I think you need to know enough about the client system to understand the best approach for the audit and to understand the risks. At the moment, the standard still requires a lot to be documented and considered, which will not impact the audit approach or add value. We will value feedback from people in this area and it is one of the areas we are focusing on in the working group. Biggest stumbling block is scope and application. The exposure draft explains in detail the qualitative characteristics of LCEs but there are bound to be disagreements in this area and about situations in which an apparently simple entity turns out to be more complex than auditors first thought. It's possible that size criteria added locally will go some way to dealing with these issues biggest concern for firms in this area is that the regulator takes a different view from them on the application of the standard. Um, Catherine H and Fiona, there seem to be worries about creating a two-tier profession here. Should we be worried? Catherine H first. It's clear that some firms are very concerned that they're going to have to run two parallel methodologies, software and training systems, but that might be based on past practice when first had smaller company audit systems that weren't integrated with the main systems. Technology has come a long way since then and the IWSB has gone to pains to keep a clear link between the ISAs and this document. And I think it will make a lot of difference, but it is something we're looking at. But we are used to dealing with different standards. A number of us have some clients that report under IFRS and others that report under FRS 102. My take is that mobility in the profession is clear from this panel. All three of us trained with larger firms and then moved on to smaller audits. Diversity and mobility are important to the profession and it's critical that someone can train, say, in a smaller firm and then go to a larger one or vice versa. As Catherine has just said, the draft LCE standard is clearly mapped against the full ISAs and I do not believe that any experienced auditor will find it difficult to understand the requirements of both and the differences between them. You're listening to the ICAEW Insights in Focus podcast. Catherine B, just to bring you in here, wouldn't it be easier if IWSB just adopted some sort of building blocks approach and had a basic audit for all entities and some add-ons for larger ones, the sort of principles-based auditing standards we've been talking about for so many years? It's a good question, Sophie, and yes, for sure it it would. Fiona's already mentioned the IAASB's Clarity Project, and some people listening will remember that as well. It was over a decade ago now, and it was meant to distinguish what was applicable in virtually all cases, in virtually all audits, and, and what wasn't. And unfortunately, what happened was they took a fairly cautious approach 
and there was a lot that went into the virtually all cases uh, bucket, if you will, that perhaps should have gone into the other bucket. But it had some limited success. It did make ISIS clearer. And it was the source of a distinction between requirements and the application material, the requirements that are mandatory and that the application material, which is supposed to explain how the requirements are are, are applied. But it's clear that there's a great deal more needs to be done to make ISIS truly scalable at the less complex end of the spectrum as, as well as proportionate. Proportionate. Difficult to follow language is a big issue here. For a whole host of reasons, ISIS have far too much repetition. They use overlapping terms and they're generally very, very wordy where they don't need to be. And that gives lots of people, not just users, but translators, big headaches. Um, and it, it would, you wouldn't think that translation would, would have an effect on audit quality. But if you think about it, it's inevitable that it does have an effect on audit quality because if things don't get translated right, or you've got three or four different words used in English, that have a different nuance in English, but are translated as exactly the same word in foreign languages, you're going to have people doing different things in, in different jurisdictions. So, and for this reason, and we've been talking to IAASB about this for many, many years, and they do have another project in this area. And that project is called the CUSP project, C-U-S-P. And C-U-S-P stands for complexity, understandability, scalability, and proportionality. And among many other things, they're trying at long last to make sentences and paragraphs shorter and less repetitive. And, th and that has to be a good thing. And they're also thinking about using style manuals and how to write properly for a, for a technical audience. But all of this is going to operate on a prospective basis. It's going to take a, a very long time before it works through the full set of ICES. And we know from the uh, proposals from the Nordic Federation of Accountants back in 2016 that there is a very real risk that jurisdictions will go their own way and develop their own standard for the order of smaller entities um, if IAASB doesn't take a lead in this area. Um, and Catherine and Catherine now, um, how do you want members to engage with ICAW as you're developing ICAW's draft response through the working group? Uh, Catherine H first. The IAASB's proposals aren't as radical as they could have been, and we're looking for detailed comments on what they have proposed, as well as answers to the specific questions. What we really need is good quality suggestions about what more the IAASB can take out, and how it can further modify the requirements as they stand without losing the link to the ISAs. That's right, Catherine, and we do need those comments sooner rather than later. The response deadline for this exposure draft is the end of January uh, next year, and we're right now beginning to develop our first draft response. And the quality of what we put in here in terms of comment will have a direct effect on the quality of the final standards approved by IAASB. And what we really need people to do is to get their sleeves rolled up at, and tell us not just what can safely be removed from this standard, because for sure IAASB wasn't as radical as it could have been, it wasn't as courageous as it could have been, and there's stuff in there that probably can safely go. But in some areas, they've modified their wording. They're trying very hard, and quite rightly so, to maintain the link with this between this standard and the existing um, ISAs, but they have modified some of their wording. And we need to know from users of this standard or likely users of this standard what can be worded differently and how it can be worded. What, what the staff at IAASB desperately need is suggestions as to what they could have done better in all of this. And an interesting aspect of this is that we're fully expecting some reverse engineering or retrofitting here. This exercise will for sure show up some weaknesses in the main full extended ISAs and sooner or later they will be amended as as a result of what IAASB learns from this project. So we're going to get a double benefit from this. If we're modifying it in the LCE standard, it's likely that we may end up modifying it in the in the main standard as well. And Fiona, 
There's been some suggestion that these proposals might work better in jurisdictions outside the UK, where audit exemption limits aren't so high, and that if we were to adopt this standard in the UK when it's finalised, there'll be confusion in the market. Do you share these concerns? No, I don't, Sophie. I really cannot see that there will be confusion. The principles are still the same. It's simply that some of the prescriptive requirements, which are not necessary when auditing entities that are not complex, have been removed. I do not share the concerns and very much hope that this standard will be adopted swiftly in the UK and indeed globally once it has been finalised and issued by the IAASB. And Catherine and Catherine, what are the dangers do you think of not adopting this standard both globally and in the UK? Uh, Catherine B first. Well, there are a number of um, issues here. We've seen audit exemption limits rise um, in the UK, as they have done in other jurisdictions over the years. But when we've responded to government on their consultations in this area, we've always warned about the potential slow deterioration of the quality of information on the public record. And of course, we know that there are many voluntary audits that are performed. In the third sector, you've got audits, statutory audits that are performed at a, a much lower level and the quality of those audits needs to be maintained. And Fiona said right at the outset, the global consensus on auditing standards that the IAASB, the International Standards Center, has built up over the last 40 years is a remarkable achievement. It really is a remarkable achievement. Those of us who remember when it started doing this, and we started adapting material, examination material, and looking at this back in the in, in the mid 1990s. It was very basic in those days. They were they were lowest common denominator standards, and they were uh, largely adopted to be begin with by jurisdictions that didn't have their own standards. But since then, in, in, in those intervening years, IWSB standards have become world leading standards. And it would be an absolute tragedy if that consensus was to start to break up because nothing was done to make sure that high quality IWSB audits, global standard audits and not some local variant, were still available. We've got to make sure that they're still available to the millions of less complex entities, whether they're statutory audits or not statutory audits, those millions of less complex entities that contribute so much to the global economy. And in the UK, it's particularly important that we have a healthy audit market at the smaller end with people coming through from firms of all sizes. Personally, I welcome the draft standard. I don't think it's perfect and does still need some further work, but it is a step in the right direction. I understand there is some concern that if this standard was published and accepted globally, just not adopted formally by the FRC in the UK, there is some concern that within the UK we could end up seeing unqualified accountants or auditors trying to report under this standard for the non-statutory audits. Audit is really valuable to the SME sector but the costs are increasing, which will undermine the value. Standards continue to bring in additional requirements due to issues to address audit failures with public interest entries and more complex areas. Some of these are just not relevant to a quality audit for an LCE and means that the order spends time having to explain why things are not relevant or doing work that doesn't add to anything to the audit or the audit quality, just to meet requirements in the standards. As if they don't, they can be criticised and fined by regulators. Having a separate standard for LC audits is not about cutting corners or less quality. A standard that is based on the principles of the ISAs, but making sure it is relevant to the less complex audits, means you can and should have a much more focused and better quality audit. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, That seems to be an excellent note to end on. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I'd also like to thank my panellists, Fiona Wilkinson, Catherine Harding and Catherine Bagshaw for the insights and knowledge they've shared with us. I've certainly found these discussions fascinating. We're aware that there are mixed views on some of these issues and would greatly welcome yours as we develop our response to IAASB's exposure draft. We also just wanted to let you know about an event we're holding in November. We're hosting a conversation with Tom Seidenstein, chair of IAASB, on the subject of less complex entity audits. The conversation will take place on 12th of November and you can attend in person at Chartered Accountants Hall or virtually. Tom will be joined by speakers including Mark Babington, the FRC's Executive Director of Regulatory Standards, and Kai Morton-Hagen, Chair of the Less Complex Entity Task Force and IASB Board Member.
You can find out more and book at icw.com forward slash events. Thank you again and goodbye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to hear more from ICAEW, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. 